Okay, now on to uh, the third learning objective for this module on evidence-based policing. And what I'm going to focus on here is how we can translate these three crime prevention principles of proactivity, tailored strategies, and place-based approaches to just everyday patrol activities. And the examples I'm about to give you are really just a few, but the sky is the limit here. There are many, many options available to the police. And again, at the end of this presentation, I'll provide some free resources that you can access this information. And also the study guide will also have this information listed. Okay, now first, although the focus of today's module and of evidence-based policing more generally often is in proactive, place-based, and tailored responses, I'd like to start with what you can do when you're actually responding to calls for service or making arrests that also use these general principles. First, get into the habit of responding to calls for service with an eye on the future. So what I mean by this is, does this crime give you any clues about whether a similar crime will occur here in the future? Can this crime give you a clue about the deeper problem at hand? Can this victim or witness or even offender give you any further information about the crime in the area besides just the information that you're receiving from the 911 call? Second, certain calls for service occur again and again, and these calls have been well researched. Take, for example, domestic violence. We now know from research that although mandatory arrest is often the norm for many agencies, Arrest may not necessarily reduce recidivism. In some cases, it may make matters worse. But officers often have to make arrests in many domestic calls for service, especially if you have a mandatory arrest policy. Research, however, also tells us that how the arrest and how the call is handled matters to re-victimization and future offending. Interestingly, the way that officers treat offenders even when they are arresting them, that is being professional and respectful, can affect those offenders' future cooperation and recidivism rates. Further, following up with victims with specific information and informa uh, interventions may be useful. And in cases where offenders need to be arrested and incarcerated, how an officer responds begins the process of appropriately building the case for incarceration. Similarly, we know from research that burglaries are more likely to be solved and the offender arrested when certain factors of the case are present. Some of these factors depend on how well an officer responds to that call for service and follows up either with evidence collection or case building. Even if the offender is arrested on scene, what you're doing when you're responding to the call for service has future implications. Okay, but let's get to the meat of the matter with evidence-based policing. And this is, uh, I'd like to give you some ideas on what to do in between calls for service or in between when you're not making arrests or responding to calls. Now keep in mind that the patrol officer's goal is this time in between calls for service, this 40 to 80% time that officers are not responding to calls. And this time is directly related with your ability to fight crime in your beat. So what can you do during your downtime that can make you more effective as a patrol officer? Here are some examples. One of the most important things you can do is find out where the hotspots are in your beat and in neighboring beats and patrol them. Even if you are writing a report in your car, you can have a deterrent effect if you happen to be in the right place when you're writing that report. Park your car in a hot spot when you write that report. Of course, whether you're in a hot spot or not, always try to maintain situational awareness when you're using your mobile terminals or writing your reports inside your vehicles. There's a further strategy called Coper Curve Patrol, named after Professor Chris Coper, that says you only need to stay in hot spots for short periods of time to have an effect. In other words, the idea is to visit hot spots unexpectedly for short periods of time. You don't need to sit in a hot spot all day to have a significant effect on crime in that hot spot. 
And this makes hotspots policing uh, and the COPER uh, patrol hotspots approach highly conducive to the time in between calls for service, which might be 15 or 20 minutes. Another proactive idea is to access your CAD system or ask for help from your dispatcher or station crime analyst about what are the top repeat call generating addresses in your beat. List them out in one column and then try to determine what the deeper problem and solution is in another column. Try to address the problem in between calls for service, getting help and ideas from what others have done, for example, in the matrix or the POP guides or, or community-oriented policing guides. Carefully study environmental clues, which give you clues as to what might be causing crime. Does a house have, have to be properly boarded up? Does a fence or door need to be repaired? Does a property manager need to be alerted? Does a shrub need to be removed to increase visibility? Does a civil code need to be enforced? And focus on repeat offenders in hot places. One way to identify potential offenders and improve guardianship is to ter determine who's on probation and parole in your beat and work with probation officers to monitor these individuals. Get to know past and potential offenders, ensuring them that crime will not be tolerated in your area. A couple more ideas. Another idea is to be more focused and proactive in getting to know service providers and non-police partners who operate in your area. Now these can be guardians like block watch captains, community leaders, probation officers, or residents and business owners. But these might also include social services, drug treatment providers, health service workers, or even crosswalk attendants. They often have important information and perspectives to the problems in your area they may, that may not be obvious to you. Some have argued that focusing on soft crimes like disorder, unsupervised teens, public drinking or intoxication, graffiti, uh, trash, abandoned housing or cars, or broken facilities. Some argue that these things can provide opportunities or a welcome mat for other types of disorders and crimes. Identifying these issues quickly, proactively taking reports or acting upon them may also be a tailored and place-based approach to crime prevention. And here are some more proactive, focused, and tailored ideas that you might consider or, adopt, um, or adapt to the specific problems in your jurisdiction. Many of you may be patrolling suburban areas that have strip malls or shops along roadways that have high levels of retail theft. A common response police take is to wait for the crime to happen and then rely on stores to call the police to pick up shoplifters. However, very targeted foot patrol may be helpful here. Don't just patrol in front of the store. Get out of your car, enter the store, even if just for 10 minutes. Remember the COPER curve principle. Doing this at random and unexpected times at high crime locations may have a, a positive effect. Further, use technology to your advantage. Learn how to use your district's LPR car or license plate readers which is a simple and easy to use technology. Know where the CCTV cameras in your beat are located, who is monitoring them, and how you might access that, those CCTV cameras from inside of your patrol car, effectively being in two places at once. Many CCTV cameras broadcast on, the internet, on internet sites, which can be accessed by smartphones or mobile terminals. Finally, one important crime-fighting tool when used lawfully, ethically, and respectfully, can be traffic stops and field interviews. Simply getting out of your car in between calls, in hot spots, and conducting pedestrian and traffic stops can help reduce crime. Now for those of you interested in even more advanced ideas, there's so many ideas that are out there. And again, you can find these in the matrix or in the pop guide or in the study guide attached to this presentation. For example, there are things like civil remedies and nuisance abatement that can evict criminogenic residents or owners. There are things like crime prevention through environmental design. Some of you might have heard of this. It's called SEPTED that can help identify specific causes of crime at specific places. 
And there is something called pulling levers approaches, or another uh, option might be drug market initiatives that can also reduce crime at hotspots. These types of interventions not only rely on police, but rely on many other social service providers to help with reducing the, the violence or the drug crime problem. Again, we don't have time to go into all of these here. However, you can obtain some more information from a number of different places. For example, the evidence-based policing matrix, which I've already mentioned it in learning objective number two, reviews about 120 different types of crime control interventions. You can actually go in and look at short summaries of each of these interventions and what the studies found in terms of their crime prevention effectiveness. The Problem-Oriented Policing Center also has a number of freely available um, tools and guides on different types of crimes and ways to proactively ad address certain types of problems. In the late 1990s, the U.S. Congress commissioned a review of crime prevention programs by the University of Maryland. Here I'm just showing you one chapter which focuses on place-based approaches, SEPTED, situational crime prevention, and other measures that you might find useful in reducing crime at places. And finally, there's also something called the National Police Research Platform, which is created by funding through the Department of Justice that provides research on other aspects of policing like stress, health, and police behavior. Again, these are just a few of the many resources that are available to you about what you can do to effectively reduce crime in your patrol areas. And links can be found at the Center for Evidence-Based Crime Policies website or just by exploring sites like the Bureau of Justice Assistance or the National Institute of Justice. Again, this concludes learning objective number three. And next, and in our final uh, learning objective, we'll explore some of the challenges that you might face when implementing some of these tactics. Thank you.